All right, uh, let's get started. Uh, thank you everyone for, for joining today's webinar uh, offered by WorkTango, Reset Instead. If you're a regular to these webinars, you likely um, realize that I'm not Rob Catalano. Uh, Rob typically leads these webinars, but due to some connectivity issues he's been having, I'm stepping in for today's webinar um, and really excited to be introducing our guest today or our speaker today, Steve Brown. Um, my name is Julia Lataka. I work at WorkTango as a survey specialist working with organizations and helping them really understand employee sentiment and get employee feedback. Now, we've seen a huge uptick in um, just the use of our, our platform and really organizations looking to understand and listen to their employees through these changes that we've all gone through when it comes to work in the past year and a half. Um, and today, we're really at a point where we're kind of moving away from remote working to thinking about the future of return to work. That's a common phrase used now, the return to work. However, today's webinar is really focused more around reset. Um, we, when we're thinking about return to work, that kind of seems like we're moving backwards, back to the back to something that was in the past and maybe something we call normal. But uh, in today's session, we really want to think about how do we reset and move forward? How do we reset as a professional, as an individual, as an HR leader, as well as an organization to kind of lead the new normal and um, and move forward in the right direction? Well, thank you all for joining. I will now be turning it over to our speaker, who is Steve Brown. Really excited to have him as our speaker today. Uh, Steve Brown is an accomplished author, um, speaker, and chief people officer at La Rosa. So he's, he's been in the industry for quite a long time. And he's also really active on social media. So I know he'll kind of be sharing his, his um, Twitter handle in a few ways that he, you can engage with him. Um, but definitely feel free to kind of engage with him on social media platforms. And, um, and yeah, before we get started, I guess, Steve, would love to kind of maybe learn a bit more about you. Um, what's one thing that we wouldn't, we wouldn't know about you just based on your LinkedIn profile? Wow, one thing. Uh, I got lost in Chinatown in high school. I was in a singing group and a group of us from the Midwest went on our own and we went to Chinatown. And while we were there, we went into a restaurant that was only Chinese. It did not, no one spoke English and we weren't sure how to order and we couldn't read the menu and the family there was so good. So there were three of us. We had a great time. And at the end, they were making dumplings and we kept watching. And what they did is they had us stay and learn how to make dumplings. And it was the best experience we've ever had. And I never would have known that because it was outside my comfort zone, but it was worth trying something new. That's amazing. So you're a dumpling expert now. You could make really awesome dumplings. I, I can fold a, I can fold a dumpling. I didn't have to cook them, but I could oh, okay. crazy. do the crimping and stuff like that. It was great. It was a lot of fun. That's awesome. Sounds like a really great experience. So uh, thank you, Steve, for being here with us. I will now turn over um, kind of screen sharing and just the floor to you. And again, everyone, uh, we will be answering questions along the, the webinar. So definitely feel free to use that Q&A box and it will be managed by myself and a few of us as well. This is a picture from 40 years ago. I played basketball and I was very good uh, in high school and wanted to play in college. And it was a lot of fun. What was interesting was, and I know, I mean, check out the sweet feathered hair, the really short shorts, the cool tube socks that come up to your knees. Uh, I know it's black and white and that's because it's that old. Uh, we were purple and gold. So we were rocking it, man. And it was a lot of fun. And I really liked being on the team and if I could return to that and go back to those good memories and be on those teams with those guys, and we were very successful, I would do it today. What you don't understand is this. I was on a team in a small school and in a small school, you can do many things. So I was in choir and on the academic teams, I was the student council president and I was on the basketball team. I was you know, one of those guys that got to do everything the coach I had was like Bobby Knight. And for those of you who are younger, Bobby Knight was an incredible coach in uh, the 70s and 80s uh, from Indiana University. Uh, but he was known for his temper. He was known for degrading his players. And he was known for just being brutal. And my coach was a lot like that. So even though I was very successful for him and for the team, he degraded me every day. He called me names. He called me things that you would get in big trouble for these days. And during one of our games, we were going for our seventh conference championship in a row, which was a school record. So we're going for the championship and Alan, who's number 15 behind me, 
Al and I were killing it. And I was having the best game of my career. I was leading in points. I was leading in rebounds. I had some steals and some blocks. It was a game that you dream of having. We were ahead at halftime. And we went into the locker room at halftime. And as the team sat down, I turned around and he hit me in the face with a towel. I don't want to go back to that. I, I don't want to return to that. So even though I had great success, why would I bring the bad in with it? Here's what's really interesting when you talk about all of the language that's going on in the workplace. We want to return, and thankfully, we've been built as humans to remember the good things about returning. So I want to go back and see, have all the good things, but that's not really the picture. So when we return, we go, everything will be good if we go back to the way it was. You can't because it's already changed. It's not possible. We have to reset instead. And this is what I want to talk about with you today. When you talk about resetting, it's looking forward. It's not that you don't value what's behind you, but you don't have to yearn for what was because not everything in the past was good at your workplace pre-pandemic or go farther back than that. When you hear people at your work tell the old stories, it's fun to hear from them, but they tell you this much of it. They don't tell you all the other fabric around it. If companies would reset instead, both personally, professionally, and organizationally, I think it'll change how you do work. And if we can change how we do work, we can make workplaces better going forward, which would be far more exciting than just getting out of the pain and trial that we've been through. The first thing though you have to come to terms with is uh, the myths that still exist in organizations. And these are the things that are more the myths of returning and I'll just, we'll have some fun with this, I hope, because I think you'll be able to identify with almost all of them, if not all of them. The first thing is this. Everybody thinks that everything's on fire all the time. When you come to work, it's fascinating to listen to conversations at workplace. Hey, what's going on? I am so busy. Oh my gosh, life's on fire. Ah! And I think people do that to say that they feel valued. Uh, but here's something I want you to have as takeaways. And, and please, when I, quick aside, when you do webinars or presentations and stuff like that, and people want, I want the five point model, I want this model, I want that, I think that's lazy. I think you should have the takeaways that matter to you. So if something here hits home, anchor with that, share that in your organization, work with it, develop it, and make it your own. But don't just say, give me the five points, because the five points at my place aren't the same five points at your place. We work at different places, so things are going to happen differently. But this is a great example of everything is on fire all the time. I work for a pizzeria, and we make the best pizza in the world. And for those of you in Canada, the world. And if you ever come, I would love to treat you, because we do have great pizza. During the pandemic, uh, in Ohio, where I'm at, Cincinnati, Ohio, the first regulation that came down was we had to close our dining rooms. And when we closed our dining rooms, uh, that changed our business completely. It says we are delivery, carry out, pick up. We had that already going, but dining rooms were a huge part of our business. So we flipped. We're like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Uh, and what happens was, and we'll come back to this, we say that we want employees to bring their entire selves to work and we don't really mean it. Because we're like, you know, you can bring everything except that emotional stuff. That emotional stuff really bothers me. Because when people get emotional, they're gonna tell me something bad and it's just gonna be awful. Our brain just goes negative. Again, like the everything's wrong type of mentality. When the pizzeria started having the shutdown with the dining room, uh, one of our managers, Frankie, uh, came out one day, and this was one of my favorite things. She came out, and so I'm standing in the dining room with my district manager, and she lost her ever-loving mind. And she said, I can't effing take this anymore. And she didn't use the word effing. She used a full-blown word. And we're like, woo, what's going on? And she says, there's this young man back there, and I told him we have to social distance, and I don't even know what that means but I told I'm supposed to do that. And so he makes some fun and he's making fun that we're all going to get a disease and we're all going to die. And I just can't take this anymore. Her world was on fire. Legitimately, this was not going well. 
Now, what happens in a lot of places is, especially from HR, the first thing we go, oh, it'll be okay. Shh, calm down. Oh, come here. Everything's be good. I'm not that guy. If you get emotional, I get emotional. I'm like, who did it? Let's find him. Let's talk to him right now. And she says, well, it's Charlie. I said, who's Charlie? She goes, he's back there on the pizza line. I said, great. So I brought the district manager with me. And I said, Joe, this is going to be a completely different way to take a look at this. But I want you to take a look at it with me. He said, sure. So I walked back and I said, hey, Charlie. Hi, I'm Steve. He goes, hi, nice to meet you. I said, do you know who I am? He says, no. I said, I'm the head of HR. He says, cool. I said, do you know what that means? He says, no. I said, it means I can fire anybody at any time for any reason. How are you doing? His face dropped to the floor. And I said, hey, what you did earlier to Frankie, not cool. Not cool. I understand you're funny. It's a joke. You were just kidding. But here's the thing. We're in a pandemic. Do you know what that is? We're in a real crisis. So I can't afford you to go you know, making death jokes because they're not funny. You came here to cook pizza. And I think you do a great job. And I'm so grateful you're here to help us through this. But you just raising the alarm bell doesn't help us at all. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to have you go back to work. Not going to write you up. Just going to take care of this. But here's the new expectation. If you continue to treat people this way, I will come across the street and let you go myself. Understand? He said, yeah. Okay. Go to work. And he did. And Joe, my district manager says, can we talk to people that way? They go, absolutely. Because we're talking about behavior and addressing when people raise the alarm bells and say the things on fire all the time, you got to figure out a way through it, not tell people to calm down, but work through the crisis with them. The next day, by the way, I came back and saw Charlie. Said, Charlie, how you doing? He says, great. Steve, man, I'm sorry. I was a jerk yesterday. I said, you were. But, you know, that happens. I've been a jerk at work. It's not a big deal. He says, Frankie and I apologize, and um, we're good. Charlie's still here, doing a great job. Frankie's still here, doing a great job. But we had to bring the temperature down. If work is always on fire all the time, why do you go to work? If everything's broken all the time, what are you doing? It's a backwards expectation. We're going to talk about it here a little later about having performance as an expectation versus crisis management constantly. Because if it's crisis management constantly, all you're doing is looking for the next fire. It's just not a healthy way to do work. It's time to reset how we do that. I love this one. In fact, I gave this presentation a little earlier and someone presented after me. It was a multiple presentation type of event. And somebody goes, I have to disagree with your slide. <laughs> that's awesome. Didn't even hear what I had to say, but they just didn't like the slide. But here's the thing. You don't have control. It's a myth. We think we have all this control. Uh, a friend of mine who's a uh, HR tech provider in the UK was trying to sell her new platform to a employer, an employer, and the employer said this. She talked about the culture and how are people going to work. And in that situation, people were going to be remote 100% still, even after some things had been lifted. And he was going to keep things remote. So he said, I expect all of my team members to be on their computer by 8. And they will stay on till 5. And if I find out they're not, we're going to address it because people need to be on the computer. And if they're not, they're not working. She said the greatest thing. What did you do before the pandemic? And he didn't know how to answer it. He, what do you mean for what I do before the pandemic? Well, before the pandemic, did you sit and watch everybody all day to make sure they were working? Well, that's not your business. Well, it kind of is because I want to choose what kind of customer I want to work with, what kind of client I want to work with. And if this is the kind of culture you want to have, I'm more of a people-focused person instead of a control-focused person. But man, if it controls what you want to do, you do that. So she chose not to work with them. So think of that. She chose not to get business that would help her launch her new platform because of the idea that someone had to be that controlling. When you look at your systems in your organizations, 
Are they meant to let people perform or constrict? I would challenge you. Most HR systems are meant to constrict. Um, people have dress code policies. Do you have a big problem with nudity? I don't get it. Well, you don't understand. Now, I understand if there are norms at your company where people have to wear a certain uniform or I, I, uh, Cintas, which is a local company here in Cincinnati, they're a uniform company. So people wear uniforms that are products of the uh, place. If someone's in a service industry and they wear the logo of the place, I get that. There's norms and those are good things. But when you have entire books and manuals and policies on all the things you can't do at work, where's your focus? Is the focus on performing? Or is it on control? Because here's what's great. Uh, real quick story. Uh, when social media first came out, I can't tell you how many seminars and webinars I saw that said, what's your social media policy? And the whole thing was, don't ever use it ever. Don't use it at work. Don't use it. Don't, don't use it. Because we were afraid people were going to say these awful things. Now, people can say awful things at any time for any reason. You can't stop that. So what was funny is as people were trying to implement these policies, people were on their phones in their hands going, hey, man, social media policy just came out. What a bunch of junk. And the company couldn't touch them because this is mine, not yours. So again, where's the focus? So instead of teaching people that social media is a form of communication and how to use it appropriately and have fun with it and have great conversations, it was let's restrict and tell people what not to do. You have to get away from the myth of control. Here's the third myth. And this is funny that we're doing a, <laughs> a virtual webinar, but I think all webinars are virtual. They always have been. Here's what's fun. If I could see all of you, and I see that there are 107 of us on the call, which is amazing. Thank you for your time and, and being here. On Zoom, it's the great example of the head nod. At companies, people don't really say what they're feeling. They just agree. They go, is that a great idea, Julia? And everybody goes, yeah, it is. And inside, I'm like, this is awful. <laughs> uh, HR people are classic with this. We have this thing. And by the way, if you don't know, I'm a kind of a toy guy. If you can see in my office, I got stuff all over. HR people do this. We give the thumbs up. We're like, yeah, things are good. Good, they're good. I'm good, you're good. Because we don't want things to not be good because then we have to deal with it. And if somebody goes, oh my God, I have a problem. You're like, you good? Oh, we just want to be done so we can move on to the next thing or get to the next thing. And we don't ask for context. And context kills us when we don't have it in organizations. You got to get people past the head nod. So if someone's given an affirmation, sweet. Ask them if they mean it. Ask them why they're agreeing. Ask them if they want to disagree. Give them the ability to disagree. Make it safe. One of the things that we're doing in our organization, and I want to jump ahead, is this. Uh, we're encouraging disagreement. How fun is that? Not conflict, disagreement. So we have several checks when we get together, either online or in meetings, to say, is everybody, does everybody feel good with where we're going? And we want to know that they do. And what we found is we're getting perspectives we never got before because people were just looking for affirmation. You got to get that deeper context to help you out. So what are ways to move forward so that we can go ahead? And I wanted to reiterate what Julia said before we get to the positive side of stuff here, if you have Q&A, pop them in the Q&A. We'll take questions all the way throughout. Okay, if you disagree, as I just said, I'm good with it. But my thing is, you know, put it in there. We'd love to have conversations with you as we go through this. Here's how you start, and it seems simple, but most people don't do it. I have this on my office wall, and I make sure that every one of our executives has this. And the reason I do this is most people don't believe this. And if you don't think that's true, uh, one of the fascinating things about the pandemic was this. They're like, HR is a leader. Like it was this aha moment. In the 2008 financial crisis, it was finance is a leader because they helped us through that. And now we found out that the pandemic was a people issue. Here's what you need to understand. 
everything's a people issue. If you don't believe this, have a conversation in your organization and listen to what happens. And I'm only using Julia because I can see her, okay? I don't want her to think that I'm just picking on her. But what will happen is we'll say, we're having this webinar and we're inviting people from all over the world. And I wonder if Julia, on and on and on and on and on. Within two sentences or three sentences, you're going to hear someone's name. So it's not that it's wrong or bad, but if it's a, if, if it's a people issue, then how do we look at people? I would like to have you do this as a takeaway. The next week, listen to conversations that you have in your organization. Hear if the conversations are encouraging and lifting people up, or if they're negative and they're talking about what people aren't doing. If you're talking about people, what people aren't doing, you don't have, you have a chance to turn that around and focus on performance to lift them up and work from strengths. So let me give you two quick examples. And I see that we have two Q&As in there. Uh, and we'll pop on those. Here's the thing. Um, at our company in December, three days before Christmas, my boss passed away. It was unexpected. Uh, he had been with us for 45 years. And he started when he was 16. <laughs> and that's typical for us. Uh, this year, I'm celebrating my 15th anniversary, which is ridiculous because I've never been in a place that long, and I'm still one of the least tenured people at the company. But I heard right before he passed away, they made me the chief people officer, which is humbling. But this is why they did it. They said, we want to be a people-centric company in everything that we do. So we want the person who's in charge of people to help lead that. And it wasn't, I'm in charge and no one else is, but it was, we want this because you're the guy who keeps telling us people are good and you show it. And we like that. Now we've been in business for 67 years as a company and we are a people oriented place, but it takes that extra effort to make it people first. And since I've been the chief CPO, you'll hear our uh, CEO walk down the hall and say this, is that people first? We'll be in meetings and go, is that people first? And if it isn't people first, as the CEO, and you hear people say this all the time, if it doesn't happen at the top, blah, 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 blah. Well, here's the guy at the top. And he says, if it's not people first, we're not doing it. And you see people in the, in the room shudder. They're like, what? <laughs> you know, what do we do? But you, you got to be people first, but you got to believe people are good. Let's see what we got here. Uh, Alberis, have you heard of the book Challenge Culture by Nigel, Nigel Travers? I have not, Al. Uh, I will check it out, though. I think that's awesome. I love recommendations. So everybody on the webinar, Challenge Culture by Nigel Travers. Thank you for sharing that resource. That's awesome. Uh, Steve, I actually have a question. Um, as an HR leader, if you are working in an organization that's maybe not people first, what are some steps you can kind of take to start shifting culture? I know culture change is, is, is hard. And sometimes if you are an HR leader, it might be kind of difficult to shift the conversation. So I'd love to kind of hear anything that you have to say about that. That's a great question. Uh, there's a couple of things. One, I will send Julia and Steven a video that my CEO just sent us that talked about how a leader who was not people first realized how bad it was and changed it because of his personal experience in a manufacturing environment. And what he found out was he learned that the response, he is responsible for the people that are under his care or under her care, or it doesn't have, you know, whoever's in charge. Instead of saying, I have all these people who do stuff for me, if you start setting the mindset of I'm responsible for their well-being, I'm responsible for their contribution. So to answer the question a little more, start valuing people for what they do inspect, instead of expecting them just to show up and work. Uh, we have a great receptionist, Dory, love her. She never misses a day. Uh, in fact, next week we are celebrating her 30th anniversary. And here's what's amazing. Dory shows up. She's going to be a receptionist the rest of her career. She's not going to be a high potential, something we'll cover in just a second. She's not going to be a manager. She's going to be a receptionist. 
And what's great is Dory shows up every day. And if we can value her for that contribution, think how amazing she'll be in doing what she does. So you don't have to be the CHRO or the CPO. Wherever you are in HR, you can start showing people value and valuing them for what they do and how they contribute. Uh, I go tell the 16-year-old pizza cooks, thanks for cooking pizza. I go tell the people at our, at our bakery, thanks for stretching dough and for coming in at four in the morning while I'm asleep. But what I do is I come in at four in the morning to tell them that. One of the ways you can start showing value and turning your company around is meeting people where they are versus where you think they should be. So if you're in an office environment and you need to talk to engineering, go see engineering. Even if you're in a global company and you have know, everything's remote, get all the engineers together or get all the salespeople together and say, hey, I want to have a meeting just to see how you're doing. Not, hey, let's go over our deadlines and our spreadsheet. Start talking about them as people. Slowly, over time, it'll start changing the culture. I want to be real candid with this slide. I understand that this could be a little disconcerting, and I never meant that. Here's, here's what I don't think happens in organizations when it comes to diversity. And this is a reset for us as a company and for us as a society. Uh, in companies, we tend to focus on high potentials and leaders and those that are visible. And we don't take a look at every single person. Dory, who I mentioned, who's our receptionist, she is so key to what we do. And I need to value her for what she does. And I think I value her because she's different. Here's what's odd up to me about diversity. Here's what you don't know about Dory. Uh, Dory is a special needs person. She walks with two canes. Her two legs aren't even. And uh, not to be cruel, her eyes go different ways. And she's our receptionist. Isn't that cool? She's the most welcoming, loving, caring person. And the thing is, she is great for who she is because she's different. We see diversity as a reality, not as a program. What's been missing in our company and in every company is inclusion. And for me, inclusion means you need to take care of everyone. So when organizations start having conversations, are you talking about a few people, a few select people? Are you trying to interweave and integrate people? Or are you trying to keep people separate and siloed? It's very disconcerting to me that we've become companies uh, that try to tear things apart instead of pull things together. So when I say everyone matters, no one should be forgotten, not one person, regardless of what they do. I mentioned the bakery. When you work, go to our bakery, if you got up at three in the morning to come and do this all day and stretch dough, I, w I made the mistake of going down there and there was a team member issue and I kind of was myopic and naive and I said, what's the big deal? They're just stretching dough. And Sue, our administrative person at the bakery said, if they don't stretch Joe, you don't have a job. They went, what? She goes, yeah, if they don't do the dough well, we can't make pizza. We don't make pizza, you don't work here. What they do matters. And it reset how I think about people and the work that they do. Too much of this return language that I see is very white color based. You know, are things going to happen? Is it a workplace environment or an office environment? Well, the majority of people don't work in offices. Did you know that? There are blue collar people all over the world who are hands on people who have been at work through this entire pandemic. We don't talk about that. I would rather see us reset the way we talk about work and talk about work, not where we work. Talk about how people can add value and move companies forward, not where they sit or if they're on TV or not. We have to be in a place where people want to be a part of your organization and they know that they're valued, they know that they're seen, and they know that they heard. And if you do that, what you'll find out is the truth that every person in your organization matters. Is there another question there, Julia? 
I yeah, we actually have two. Um, so one, I'll read it out. Um, when you encourage disagreement, do you find that people are able to discourse respectfully or do you experience emotions that flare? How do you avoid conflict versus discussion? And that was from D. D, here's the thing. I'm good with conflict. And I don't mean that, but I've, I've had people get really, really emotional uh, to the point of, I won't swear on here because it's recorded but we've used the words in meetings where you're like, wow, I didn't mean that, or I didn't want to hear that. Here's two ways to get around that. One, set the ground rules of what the expectations are in your, in your meetings. We talked about this. We need to have dialogue, discourse, and disagreement. It's safe and it's allowed. Then instead of having a, per, a meeting led, we've gone to a facilitated model. So we have facilitators of the meeting who can participate, but their go whole goal is to make sure conversation is continuing, that context is given, and if there's disagreement, to work through it respectfully. They're kind of the referee. The second thing is this. It's a new thing that we've tried in our organization, and I'm a very simple guy. Uh, we, I wrote this whole list of, and I'd be glad to share it if you'd like to email me, and I'll give you my email later. We have a playbook of behaviors. Most companies talk about mission, vision, goals, blah, 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 posters on the wall, Ugh. behavior. I believe that if you address behavior in an organization and tell people how you want people to perform and behave, not what not to do, what to do, they will. Because I believe most people are good. And one of the things we add is this, breathe, check. So before I get emotional, because I'm going to, you can't stop me from doing that. Breathe and pause. And then before you respond, who does it affect? So if it affected seven people, am I making sure that I'm communicating with all seven people? Or is it just knee jerk, boom. When that happens, we allow grace because it's gonna happen. And then we try and move forward. But what we've really put in place is breathe and check. And I'll give you a real world example. Our president, who's one of the people whose name's on the company, the LaRosa brothers, uh, he's one of my emotion, most emotional people, by far. He's passionate emotion, good dude. And he took a post-it and put it on his computer and it says, breathe, check. He's the president of the company. So if the president of the company is willing to pause, get his emotions under, under wraps, and then move forward, we have a much better chance of doing it well. What's the other one? Awesome. Um, and then from Maurice, you typically hear from hiring managers, we're not going to move forward with this candidate because they don't fit our culture. How do we ensure that our workplace culture is not being weaponized against equity uh, deserving groups? Oh, that is, thank you for the question. Sorry for the bad face. I hate that response. Uh, here's how you do it. I think you need to move away from how we typically hire. Uh, another story, I'm a story person. We don't use job descriptions to hire anymore. Because here's what's happened. People match job descriptions. You don't really know if they're talented or not. You list the four bullets, they match the four bullets. If they say the right things in the right way, they're a culture fit. That's awful. So we just hired our director of marketing, Megan, uh, just before the pandemic, yeehaw, and she stayed with us, uh, January of 2020, but we hired her without a job description. And when she met with us and all the candidates who met with us, we said, we're making a new job. We're not really sure what it is. What would you like it to be? And what we heard was her talent, her experience, her perspective. And we said, those characteristics can add to the value of our company. And by the way, completely different candidate than what we would typically have looked at in the past. And I like what you said about how uh, culture can be used weaponized because you have implicit bias that happens with people and you have unknown and or unconscious bias. You have to look at how you're hiring and how you're responding to candidates to ensure that that as much as possible that never happens. But if we keep using the old traditional models of match the bullets, that's what you're gonna get. So we had to go away from it. So when Megan got hired, I said, okay, Megan, the next person you hire can't have a job description. And she did, and we hired Kelsey, and she's amazing. 
But here's what's fascinating. Candidates chose not to interview and apply because there wasn't a job description. So we've, we've built a system that is more match game and it shouldn't be. It should be more talent. And because if we're really going to be in the talent world, let's talk about talent. Then I have less chance, not that it can't happen. I have less chance of having those biases come into play. I love this slide because this is how everybody looks every day about within five minutes of the day. And what's funny is it depends who you talk to, okay? But they're gonna happen. What's really funny is uh, the pandemic has shown us that uh, people are gonna bring their whole selves to work now and it's freaking us out. As a reset, you have to say, I love that about you. I wanna know everything about you. And if you get a little weird and wild, I'm good with it. Uh, we do a lot of laughing in our place. We do a lot of uh, having fun with each other throughout the day and much more open conversations. We also go through life situations together, just like we did over this past 15 months. We don't want to return to a place where that's stifled. Because the emotions that are not shared are emotions that are couched later and shared inappropriately, either outside of work or inside of work. Again, coming from a behavior perspective, how do you teach people to share the emotions in a great way? So we take a look at how are you recognizing people? Are you recognizing them in a timely basis? How are you giving feedback? Is feedback feedback or is it just criticizing what people aren't doing? It, it, what's really interesting when it comes to feedback, we say, hey, I need to talk to you, Stephen, about this. Well, just listen to that. <laughs> Hey, do you got a sec? We got to talk about something. I need to give you some feedback. And you can say, here comes the hammer. Can't wait to see it. I think you should do feedback more like this. I don't know if you know this. Best HR tool ever. If you, Julia, if you don't know what this is, it's a magic eight ball. Okay. Uh, but because the magic eight ball takes it all out of the thing. You can ask questions like, is Julia going to keep her job? Not likely. You go, you can't do that. Yes, you can. You gotta have a different perspective and stuff, but you gotta equip people to do it. So I wanna give you a tool that you're gonna think is crazy and it's not a slide. I think you should go on Amazon and get one of these. This is a kaleidoscope. And I've used this as a tool at my company all the time. Because when I've had to te teach people to not only focus on the negative behaviors of people, but to focus on people in a positive way, I had to have them change their viewpoint. So I gave them a kaleidoscope. And in the kaleidoscope, they cost uh, $8.99, or they did on Amazon. I haven't bought them in a while. That, uh, and then what I do is I can go around in desks, so I can go around in pizzerias, and I see people with kaleidoscopes. And it reminds them to look at things differently. Symbols work. Toys work. It, they're great things, and we don't think of these things. We give people manuals, we give people policies, we give people procedures, give them things. Because here's something we've completely forgotten in the workforce, is when kids get older, they grow up and become employees. And we expect them to go to work and we beat the kid out of them. I would much rather have a giant bunch of kids working at my place. And I'm not talking like, you know, ping pong tables or keg nights or stuff like that. Whatever you do in your culture, cool. I'm talking about do people enjoy themselves because they're allowed to be themselves at work? Uh, we, we did have two questions come up, uh, Steve. Sure. The first question is from Robin. Uh, in your opinion, why are so many C-suite leaders adamant that their employees come into the office um, versus working, continuing to work from home? Which is oh. a question I've been wondering too. So I'd love right, to hear your okay. perspective. All right. Okay, I don't have a good myth slide on this. There's an old myth back from the industrial age of if I see you, you're working. Visibility infers productivity. It doesn't. It infers I see you. And I, I, I wish I had a good answer of how to get past that. But my thing is this, back to the example of my friend who questioned the person of being on Zoom. That was not an in-person thing, okay? What are you expecting from me as a team member? Am I supposed to come and, and move us forward? Or am I supposed to show up 
and, and you've got to look at your systems HR peers. You got because if your systems are about showing up, and the majority of them are, then you set the table for what the expectation is. And what's funny is um, I knew a C-suite person at a company here. This is a terrible story. Who uh, kept their door partially closed because they were the CHRO of a local, very large public company here, uh, and they played solitaire all day. But you didn't see their computer. And when you looked at them and came through the door, the computer screen was facing their face, so you couldn't see them. And they'd pop their head up and go, hey, what's going on, Mike? How you doing? What's going on? Hey, have that conversation. While well, solitaire is on their screen for eight hours a day. And they never caught him. And he retired. But for the last year and a half of his time there, he played solitaire every day. So my thing is, call the CEO and the C-suite out on it and say, what are you expecting from the people who work with you? Here's the other quick thing to really help change and reset things. And it kind of goes to our next slide. Look at the lines you have. Are the lines constricting or are they boundaries to work within? If you have boundaries to work within, it's a lot different and a lot better. So my thing is, what isn't Steve doing? It, it, does Steve being here make a difference? And if it is, what difference? Why do you need him here? Can we do things like a hybrid model? Can we do things where we allow people to work wherever they want to do? Uh, one of the other things I challenged uh, my company was they said, somebody said, what's our work from home policy? It's not a policy. It's a procedure. Policies you get fired for. Okay. But here's the thing. The work from home thing was this. When you're at home, work. That was our expectation. So we set expectations versus having rules. What's the other question? Uh, we have two more. Maybe we can uh, do one from Tracy and then move forward and we can kind of okay. um, get to the next one after. But from Tracy, what makes it so difficult for senior leadership to embrace the humanity of business? How do you get buy-in from the executive level where, where emotions are not one of the considerations of moving business forward? How Thank do you convince you. the... Uh, sorry, I'll just finish it up. How do you convince the executive level that they're not harming their business results by uh, seeing people as people, not as means to objective, not to means to achieve goals and objectives? Um, I, I really need to share this video with you that I, that this uh, that my CEO sent because this is from the head of the manufacturing company, and he came to this aha moment because of this. Here's why why I don't think it happens is we don't treat senior leaders as people. We treat them as roles. We treat them as titles. Uh, my CEO's name is Michael. It's Michael. He owns the business. His name's on the company. Michael and I talk about his family far more than we talk about work. It's how you are treated as a person, regardless of your level. So you need to breathe that humanity or bring that humanity in from an HR perspective because you can, because HR people are with every person in the company. Okay. They are exposed to every person in the company, some level. So my thing is show them the humanity, give them the human stories, and just keep showing examples after examples. It may not turn around. It may turn around. Here's the challenge I would put out there for people, too. I'm afraid if people don't become people-centric as organizations, they're going to be gone. I really do. I think it's time for us to change it. All right, the other part of it is this, quit, quit shooting for conformity. A lot of goals in HR is let's get everybody in line and make everything work. Great HR, a great way to reset this is this, do HR individually and the whole will take care of itself. Instead of doing HR for everybody and making everybody fit that box. Because when you make it for everybody, then you blow out things like diversity, you blow out things like inclusion because you're trying to make people fit instead of giving them the parameters to work within. So I really think you have to push against conformity and uh, make sure that you're not doing it this way. And you do this by this. You're a connector that works on outcomes. You wanna position people to do well so that they can do well. It's a great way to do it. I give expectations to my team and they give expectations to me. That's a reset for us. Most expectations in companies are top down I'm in the charge, in person in charge, and I give this to the people below me. And what I wanted to say a little earlier on the senior part is this. Um, 
Quit telling people work f- they work for you. They work with you. I work for La Rosa's. I work with everybody. And I know it's semantics, but those simple things make a huge difference. Okay? If it's about four, it's a top-down relationship. We don't even get to things like answers and findings and outcomes. We just blow through it. It's more about you report to me and. Instead of saying, I get to work with you and let's work towards these common goals and these common results. It's having much more of a people focus first instead of trying to have a result focus first. And for us, that's a big reset and it's really working. The other way you can reset is this, is be a connector. One of the great things about being in HR is you're, I mentioned earlier, connected to everybody somehow. And it might be, well, I'm only connected to department heads. Okay, well, what if you got all the department heads to work well with each other? Well, I only work with the midline. Well, what if you got all the midline people to work well with each other? And taught them how to work with the senior people and have the senior people work with the mid-level people and the frontline people. The more you're a connector, the more strategic you are. It's funny, HR people have said forever, be strategic, do this stuff. The best way to be strategic by far is to be a connector. Okay, and I think it's, you can't do it nearly enough because it's not, we, we've, we keep focusing on what's broken instead of what's connected. So one of the resets we're doing in our company and part of my role is I'm building conduits. Conduits, I mean, I'm a word guy. I love conduits. Conduits are communication goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, not one way or one way or one way. Conduits go back and forth. So we build conduit constantly. And when we find that one's broken, we work on it and get it switched. So you have to work at being a connector. You can do that by this, by being an encourager. And it's really funny. Positive people make us uncomfortable. Isn't that weird? You're like, oh, he's happy all the time, or she's happy all the time. Doggone it. Don't they understand what's going on? Everybody has life going on. Uh, when I woke up today to the news of the tragedy that happened in Miami, Florida, with the building falling, that's horrible. Horrible. I don't know what they're going to do, what's going to happen. We can work with that and, and deal with that as it happens, whatever those situations are in our workplace. But you need to be an encourager. And you can do it in a variety of different ways. I think it's important to do this because you got to give people the flexibility to be who they are. We had a team member who was struggling during this time with well-being and mental health. And I'm not going to tell you details because that's not appropriate. But here's the thing. She came to us with one way of, hey, I think I need to be done because I just can't take this anymore. And her supervisor and I talked to her, and she's a long-term team member. We said, hey, we understand what you're going through. Why don't you take the month off with pay? get things together, and at the end of the month, we'll talk to you. Here's what's funny. It's not part of our leave program. It's not part of our PTO program. It's not FMLA. We just thought it was the right thing to do to give her the space she needed to figure things out. That'll happen in a few weeks that we get to talk to her, but we wanted to encourage her through this difficult time and give her the space to do this well. So try to look at what you're doing in your organization and see if you're spending more of your time positively or negatively. And you can reset by having a more positive approach on an ongoing basis. All right, Julia, I want to answer any more questions because I'm going to close with a story. Um, Yes, yeah, so Mandy reached out and asked, many organizations at the corporate office in multiple locations have an organizational culture and then subcultures at each location. So the subculture is often based on the personality of the lo- location manager. How have you experienced this at La Rosa and what are your views on how to approach them? We embrace it. So I'll give you a good example. We have a six, um, 65 stores, my goodness, 65 locations. And the culture takes on the general manager's persona. It does. So what we do is at Pleasant Ridge, we know that Tom's the general manager. So we work with Tom and the demographics of the people that are there and we embrace them for Pleasant Ridge. And we have a great time with it. And then Kathleen, who runs White Oak, which is a giant store. 
and she has all kinds of people working. Uh, she has over 120 team members and Tom's store has 30. So there's just different dynamics there. We treat their location for their location. And I know that takes a lot more time and effort, um, but what we're doing is valuing the people that are in charge. And the second thing we do is develop the leader who's in charge so that they're focusing on all their team members, not just expecting them to do work. We want them to focus on all the good people who work there at that location to elevate them and allow them to do their job the best of their ability. And then we go from there. Awesome. Um, and one last question from Tracy. Uh, what is your recommendation for employees who are abusing flexibility of hybrid working environments without quote unquote, Peter having to pay for Paul? Ah, wow, that's a great one. Uh, I believe in being intentional with people. And what I needed, what I would do is, hey, Steve, we're struggling with how work is going with your situation. I need to talk to you about that. Can you tell me what's going on? Hear their perspective. And ask these two things instead of why. We tend to go, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? Do this instead. Ask how and what. What can we do, Steve, to help this be better? And how would you do that? And involve them in the process. So if you can give people a how and what, it gets less defensive and you can have those hard conversations uh, and then address the behavior uh, if it, and tell them if it doesn't improve, here's the consequences. If it does improve, we won't move it. We won't talk about this again, but don't step away from the situation. Talk about the behavior intentionally. All right. One more basketball story. This is my daughter. She's the one on the left with the black shirt on. They both have black shirts on. Uh, she's the one, well, she's this one. Let's go there. Melanie and Melissa. Alyssa is a great friend. Uh, my daughter played basketball in high school and uh, she was not nearly as good as her father. And that's not a shot at my daughter. She just wasn't. And she went to a very large school versus a very small school. Uh, my graduating class had a class of 73. Her graduating class was 723. So her to even make the basketball team was amazing. And as she got to be a senior, uh, other girls came up in the program that were better than her. And the coach called me and said, hey, I don't think Melanie will make the team this year. And I don't think she'll be able to even see the floor. And I just want to talk to you about that. And I said, okay well, what do you want to do? And she goes, I'd like to make her a coach. And I said, what? Now, this is completely different thinking. And I said, why would you make her a coach? She goes, I love your daughter. And she adds so much value to our team, but just not on the floor. I need her on the sideline to be an encourager and lift people up and, and cheer people on. And I'm going to give her tasks and, uh, and responsibilities. This isn't just some fake thing. And she took her out to shop for clothes so she could dress like all the coaches. And it was great. In my daughter's senior year, she was a coach. She was still included. She wasn't cast aside because this coach was willing to reset instead of return to the old model of if you're not skilled enough, you're off the team. My daughter is now an occupational therapist and a doctor. And she worked through the entire pandemic taking care of people. She still keeps in touch with every one of her teammates. You have to look at people differently. You have to look at people as having value and have a people first focus. And if you do that and reset your company, you are sure to do well going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. That was a really great way to end. Um, end the conversation today and also learn a bit more about yourself. Any last minute questions, please throw them into the Q&A. Um, you know, I, I really enjoyed this, really had a positive kind of note and tone to, to kind of resetting and, and going back to the workplace. So thank you much. Thank you so much, Steve, for, for joining us. And I'm sure a lot of people found it valuable. Where can people connect with you? Because I'm sure a few people would love to connect with you. I would love to connect with you on LinkedIn. Please send me an invitation. I would be glad to connect with you on the, on the stop. Understand that it's on if we're connected. I'm also on Twitter at SBrownHR, but again, it's on. 
uh, get connected with me and we'll have great conversations.